Good morning and welcome to worship at the First Presbyterian Church of Dallas. We're grateful for your company. Today we'll be in the 37th chapter of the book of Genesis. We'll be exploring the beginning of Joseph's story. His father Jacob loves him and his brothers don't. Today I'm joined in worship leadership by our director of music, Zach Light Wells, my colleague, associate pastor, Rebecca Chancellor Six. Our guest organist today is Grady Coyle and there'll be vocalists from our chancel choir. As we prepare to enter into this time of worship, I hope and I pray that you will find yourself in a place where you can enjoy this experience and also draw from it strength for the challenges that are to come and also encouragement and inspiration for the days ahead. And now let us enter the house of God to worship the Lord. The psalmist tells us that when we turn to God in our hearts, God speaks peace to the faithful. As we turn to God in true confession of our sin, we trust in God, whose peace makes us whole. Join me in prayer. O oh God, you are the source of clear, far-sighted vision. Yet we go from day to day wondering where life is headed. You are the creator who births us. You care for us as a mother cares for her children. Yet we often feel as though we are on our own. You are the fire in our souls, the passion for truth and life where imagination runs free. Yet we follow the usual round, 
our imaginations bound by what is or what has been. Forgive us, Creator God. Pour into us the fire of your passion and flame our hearts, ignite our spirits. May we burn against injustice. May we be energized as agents of creative change. And may this fire be kindled by your love. Friends, Jesus is Lord. God raised him from the dead and we are saved through him. Trust and believe in the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven, healed, and made whole. Amen. Glory to God, whose goodness shines on me and to the Son, whose grace has pardoned me and to the Spirit, whose love has set me free as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be. Friends, we have received the good news in the promise of grace. So let us share the peace of Christ with each other. The peace of Christ be with you. I invite you now to share signs of Christ's peace with others. Phone a friend. Reach out to someone in your home. Share the peace of Christ on social media or in other creative and safe ways. Whatever works for you, let us all share freely the peace that we have received. And let us now also respond to God's grace and peace with our offerings. We remember that everything we have is a gift from God. So let us return to God the gifts of our lives and labors. You may go to the church's website to give online. And if you haven't already, you can set up automatic giving. If you are interested in learning more about First Presbyterian Church of Dallas, and how you might participate in the life of our congregation or join the church as an active member, I encourage you to go to our website at fpcdallas.org and click on the button that says, Start Here. We do look forward to hearing from you and hope to connect with you soon. The peace of Christ be with you all. May the peace of Christ be with you. The peace of Christ be with you. May the peace of Christ be with you. Peace of Christ to you. <laughs> peace of Christ be with you. May the peace of Christ be with you. May the peace of Christ be with you. Our scripture reading this morning is from Genesis chapter 37. I'll be reading the first four verses. Listen now for God's word as it comes to you and for you. Jacob settled in the land where his father had lived as an alien, the land of Canaan. This is the story of the family of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was shepherding the flock with his brothers. He was a helper to the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report for, of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his children because he was the son of his old age and he had made him a long robe with sleeves. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The title of this sermon is Shiny Coats. 
When I was young, maybe four or five, my adopted grandmother who lived off in California visited our family over on the East Coast. And my memory of the visit includes only one conversation between the two of us. As I recall, we were standing on the sidewalk below our apartment complex, waiting for traffic on the street right below us to ease up so that we could cross over. I think she was walking me to my preschool, which was just down the hill. Now, I don't remember exactly what I said as a prelude to the lesson that she would give me that morning on the sidewalk, but whatever it was that came innocently tumbling out of my mouth was met with immediate disapproval. I had no idea my grandmother could get that upset. The only thing I know about my part of the conversation was that I told her that I hated something. Now, maybe it was the traffic or the weather that day. It's possible that the hatred I re referenced wasn't even my own. You know, I could have been re repeating something that I heard an adult say because, you know, seriously, what exists in the life of a preschooler worthy of actual hatred? No matter if I was talking about me hating or someone else doing the hating, she let me know that morning that hate is a word that I should never use, ever, no matter what. And then we crossed the street. And here I am 35 years later telling you this story about what my grandmother said. Clearly, it had an impact on me. And the rest of Joseph's story is predictable. Brotherly jealousy has a way of leading to negative outcomes for everybody. Nobody wins when somebody hates. And this story of a band of brothers that breaks up in spectacular fashion is no different. Joseph's privileged place in his father's heart is undeniable. He will wear the shiny, fresh coat, the coat that Scripture calls a robe. He's going to wear this shiny, fresh coat given to him by his father with pride. You can see Joseph now walking around the house with his fresh, shiny coat on. But Joseph's brothers are not as impressed with Joseph as Joseph is. Joseph does not do much to help his case. The only time that we hear him speak in the early verses of chapter 37, he's either telling on somebody for bad behavior or He's telling his brothers about one of his fantastical dreams that always seemed to end with his family members or some planetary object like the sun, the moon, or the stars bowing down to him in reverence. Now, if you're reading the Joseph novella at the end of Genesis to yourself the first time through, I would not fault you for gleefully anticipating the inevitable measure of come up or payback that you can tell Joseph has coming for him. The story of Joseph and his shiny coat coming between him and his brothers is supposed to serve as a bridge between the patriarchal origin stories of Genesis and the epic story of the Israelites escaping bondage in Egypt. The narrators had to find a way to get the Israelites from wherever Joseph and Jacob and his Joseph's band of brothers were all the way down to Israel. Now, Egypt and that land that Joseph's brothers are tending, the land that was promised to the descendants of Abraham, aren't anywhere near each other. To connect the two, the biblical narrative once again employs the tragedy of lost love between brothers to explain how a whole bunch of people ended up on the wrong side of the tracks. We've already seen it in the Cain and Abel story. And then in the Jacob and Esau story. These hyper-local jealousies and resentments and the selfishness of siblings never seems to stop at one of them being put in timeout. Instead, the arguments over birthrights, blessings, and who's got the blingiest coat become geopolitical rivalries that are inherited by generation after generation until death does them part or the grace of God intervenes. Scripture keeps telling us that the consequences of some sin are not buried with our bodies but are passed down as easily as our bald spots. 
And the brothers don't know it yet, not in the first four verses of chapter 37, but Joseph is not their enemy. Joseph is a 17-year-old dreamer that has the eye of his father and a fancy coat. He will preen and peacock his way through the next 30 verses of this chapter, annoying us and his brothers with his breathless narration of self-congratulatory dreams, but selling him into slavery to a caravan of foreigners on their way to Egypt seems like cruel and unnecessary punishment to me. But I don't think that they can help it. I think that's why my grandmother said, never say hate, because once you start hating, cruel and unnecessary punishment is soon to come. Now, I don't know about you, but I'd like to think that I could have found a less calamitous way to resolve the hate that they held for him four verses in. But they wouldn't. Their fate was sealed. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. All the brothers' fate, Joseph and all of his brothers, was sealed four verses into the story. Hate is a zero-sum emotion. The results always end up in mutual self-destruction. Nobody wins in this generation or the next. Joseph is not his brother's enemy. Hate is, because once it starts, it's difficult to stop. It's been reported uh, that we only hate those that we love or those that we once loved. And it has been reported that we hate, on average, five people in our lifetimes. By the way, ex-husbands and co-workers are cited as the most hated people in psychological studies. These same researchers have concluded that most people don't experience hateful feelings until about age 12, but the, the range is wide. Some people don't feel the emotion until they're 40. Most important for our purposes is the conclusion that hate is a relatively uncommon emotion to experience. When people are asked to define hate, they can only talk about it as an extreme form of another emotion that they experience, like disgust or anger. It doesn't come naturally to us, but when it comes on, there doesn't seem to be an easy way to slow it down. But, but, if you think you're immune to experiencing the emotion, then consider if you've ever attempted to eliminate someone from your tribe, clan, village, membership, or memory. Most of us wouldn't admit to hating someone enough to throw them into a pit and sell them into slavery like Joseph's brothers did, but we are prone to make attempts at eliminating people in other ways. Joseph's brothers could have killed him, but instead they choose to make his life intolerable by erasing him from their family story. They don't want him to die. They just don't want him to live anymore with his shiny new coat. Stripped bare, Jesus the Christ was lifted high above another band of brothers. The Roman soldiers below him were bartering for his coat and fighting over his sandals. And what did they care? You know, he was too weak to fight back. Perfect in love, he used his last breath to forgive those who hated him, who cursed him to death. Innocent as a dove, he bore the stains of all humanity on his shiny coat of righteousness as he died for no reason. They wanted to eliminate him erase him, send him to a certain death and demonstrate that the first would not be last and the last would not be first because, well, because the world isn't supposed to give shiny coats to less than perfect people. But God can't help it. In the kingdom of God, even brats like Joseph get a coat. And so my prayer for us is that we'd notice the shiny coat of possibility that each of us wears as a child of God. 
Because as we'll find out from Joseph, God chooses to use those that we hated for their youthful foolishness to redeem the wise. In the name of God, the Creator, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Every day we go to war again, but we assume we know so much more than them before we hear what they have to say. Headline breaks, and we start to hate again, calling them names again. We give our peace away I hope they see it Cause I want to see it I hope we believe it Cause I want to see I want to see the love All around
Let us pray. God of power and love, you are with us in every circumstance of this life. We thank you for your steadfast faithfulness. We thank you for the gift of your peace, which comes to us even in times of chaos and fear, trouble and doubt. If we are honest, we feel more fear and uncertainty than we like these days. The ground beneath us feels unstable, maybe even gone as though we've been tossed into an empty pit. We wonder where you are and what your spirit is doing. We wait and search and wait some more. When we are hungry or tired or sweaty or worn out, when we feel unseen and cast out, when we feel lonely or afraid, help us to keep seeking, O oh God. When we are in pain, when we are sick in mind, body, or soul, when we are isolated from friends and family, when there is too much change for us to keep up, help us to keep seeking, O oh God. When there is chaos around the world, when nations are at war, when people are dying at alarming rates, when people are killed out of hate, terror, or brokenness, when there is division, help us to keep seeking, O oh God. When there is a desire for mutual understanding and growth, when there is a desire for healing and unity, when personal relationships are estranged and hurt, when your creation groans, help us to keep seeking, O oh God. When we feel unworthy or unwelcome, when we struggle with doubt, when we endure prejudice, when we need a soft place to land, help us to keep seeking, O oh God. We thank you for your powerful arms of mercy that grasp us when we are sinking, for your powerful word that coaxes us even when we are hiding or afraid. We put our trust in you, for you alone can save us. Help us to keep seeking, O oh God, and help us to dream. May our dreams be bold and alive in seeking your kingdom to be a reality on this earth. May our dreams align with yours to create beauty, diversity, and love. May your spirit keep nudging us to seek you, to dream big, and to love. So help us each day to love you and our neighbors and to put action to our prayers. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now let us affirm our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Now, friends, go in peace. You've been set free to love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And as you go, may the road rise to meet you, the wind be always at your back, the sun shine warm upon your face, and the rains fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. Amen and amen.